It's met with a lot of fanfare and obviously a lot of folks and Dean will share his own experiences. And it's good to have the next generation really of the leaders in the space beginning to adopt this or be excited by it. Well, I think there's a number of attributes of the Optilum BPH which are unique and may set it apart from the other mists or minimally invasive treatments that are currently available. In today's much-anticipated episode, we'll be introducing the only known treatment for an enlarged prostate or BPH that does not require heating, cutting, removal of prostate tissue, or leaving a permanent implant behind. I'm very excited to have an all-star cast today on the show. They both are past guests on the Prostate Health Podcast and are joining us today for another appearance, Dr. Stephen Kaplan and Dean Elterman. You definitely don't want to miss this one, so stick around. So the big question is this, how can men and those who care for them better educate themselves regarding prostate health, the conditions that affect the prostate, and the latest technology in managing these conditions? That is the question, and this podcast will provide the answers. On the podcast, we'll be chatting with experts, innovators, and leaders in the field of urology, sharing useful information with the general public to improve their lives and increase their overall health. My name is Dr. Garrett Pullman, and welcome to the Prostate Health Podcast. Prostate Health Podcast is for informational purposes only. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as medical advice. By listening to the podcast, no physician-patient relationship has been formed. For more information and counseling, you must contact your personal physician or urologist with questions about your unique situation. It is my pleasure to welcome back as guests again to the Prostate Health Podcast, Drs. Stephen Kaplan and Dean Elterman. Dr. Kaplan is Director of the Men's Wellness Program at Mount Sinai Medical Center. He is an internationally renowned authority and one of the primary thought leaders in the study of benign prostate disease, the association of metabolic factors with voiding dysfunction, and with symptoms related to both benign prostate enlargement and bladder function. Dr. Elterman is an associate professor of urology at the University of Toronto and an attending urologist at the University Health Network. Certainly a rising star in helping bring new treatment options forward for BPH, Dr. Elterman is a true innovator in men's health and continues to embrace the integration of minimally invasive surgical therapy, or MIST, in the management of an enlarged prostate. Drs. Kaplan and Elterman, welcome to the Prostate Health Podcast. Great to Thank be here. You. Thank you. So I'm excited to have you both on the show today to get our listeners up to speed about a new innovative technology, Optilum BPH, which recently received FDA approval in the United States here in July for the treatment of lower urinary tract symptoms secondary to BPH. I wanted to first jump back in time, though. Dr. Kaplan, so this actually was not the first time balloon dilation was conducted for BPH, correct? Yes, I think. And you asked me because I guess I'm the older of the two. Yeah, balloon dilation started, at least for prostate disease, in the 90s and met with a lot of fanfare. And there was a couple different types of balloons. One of them was called the Dowd, a D-O-W-D balloon named after Joseph Dow, then everybody thought, this is great, we're stretching the prostate. And, and after about three months, everybody says, this is not so great, because a lot of the symptoms actually started recurring. And we've learned a lot since that time, but what the balloon basically did not really change the inherent anatomy of the prostate in retrospect. But yes, met with a lot of fanfare, and therefore also had some challenges as this is being introduced with people thinking, oh, it's the old balloon, but in fact, it's not. So as the principal investigator of both the Pinnacle and Everest trials for this new technology, Dr. Kaplan, could you explain to our listeners what is Optilum BPH? So, in fact, I tweeted this out today. So Dave Perry, who's the CEO of the company, I haven't lunch with my wife, I think it was about six years ago, around this time, actually, in August. And that was, Dave gave me a call and he says, hey, I got this interesting idea about balloon dilation. I said, Dave, you remember the Dowd balloon, right? And he said, so the same type of skepticism. And he said, no, it's a lot different because we're going to do an anterior commissurotomy because the balloons are different and the texture of balloons are different in 30 years. But what's different is also we're going to have a drug eluding component to it. So it's going to be the first medical and technology, if you will, a medical device combo. And I said, okay, it sounds interesting and different. And he goes, I'm going to need you to come up with all these protocols and help me get this FDA uh, approved. So it seems like a while ago, but 
yeah, and here we are, and it's getting just got published. And the journal Urology made the front cover, so we're pretty excited about that because a BPH doesn't get on the front cover of the journal Urology much, and certainly devices don't get on the front cover of the journal Urology. And there's going to be a big press release from journal Urology as well. So it's met with a lot of fanfare, and obviously a lot of folks. And Dean will share his own experiences, and it's good to have the next generation, really, of the leaders in the space beginning to adopt this or be excited by it. So, Dr. Elterman, you were successful in treating the world's first patient in a commercial setting with the Optilum BPH system in July. You can certainly been at the forefront of new technology for BPH. I know our listeners have really gained value from your insight as well from previous episodes, including episode 30 on aquablation, episode 45, comparing the various missed technologies and therapies. So as you have added Optilum BPH as an option for your patients, who do you consider is an appropriate candidate for the technology? Well, I think there's a number of attributes of the Optilum BPH which are unique and may set it apart from the other mists or minimally invasive treatments that are currently available. So first is that it really does marry this idea of a medication with a drug delivery device. And so it's a little bit different in terms of its comparators. The second is that it's creating a different type of defect. It's this anterior commissurotomy. We think, based on the clinical trials, really opens up the prostate circumference, the diameter of it, very, very widely. And of course, it's that paclitaxel, that medication that gets absorbed into this new raw surface within the commissurotomy that prevents it from closing down again. So Steve will talk about all of the data from the Pinnacle study, the Everest study that I was also involved in. But from a practical perspective from patients, they really like the idea that it's a non-permanent implant, right? It's inflated, it's left in sight for seven to 10 minutes, and then it's removed. And it has the ability to preserve sexual function. So we're not seeing any of the erectile or ejaculatory dysfunction you would see with a resective type of technology. And the data thus far is very promising in terms of both its degree of improvement, and hopefully we'll see with time really good durability. That transitions nicely into, you know, Dr. Kaplan, a little bit about, you know, some of that data that led to its FDA approval in both the Pinnacle and Everest trials. So when you conduct trials, and Dean's been part of this as well, and I think, Garrett, you may have been, been part of them, you know, you have to first kind of get the preliminary phase two type of information, then you got to do a sham controlled or a double blind type of study. So this was kind of cool because how do we devise something that's going to be a sham, as the case may be? And we did. And I must say that the investigators, and I give them all the credit, as well as the folks who were working together with Eurotronic, did a great job making patients believe that they were getting the sham. Because in fact, 100% of the people on sham thought that they were getting the treatment, which you never see. We've never seen, ever, which means that this was a tremendous sham trial, which is why the first three-month data on the sham arm was so good. And the degree of symptom improvement with the Eurotronic, with the Optilum device, is similar to what we've seen with Resume and Eurolift in terms of the magnitude. But what's really different, that's the game change potentially, is the improvement in flow rate. We've never seen improvement in flow rates like this. And we saw it at three months and we saw it was durable at 12 months. So it's almost what we've seen with TERP and green light and some of the other types of technologies, almost surgical-like. And as Dean alluded to, in theory, the reason is because you're doing an anterior commissurotomy. So unlike the old Dowd balloon with just you know, opened and closed, you're splitting the top. So instead of making, if you imagine that the urethra is like an opening, like an O, and you're not making the O bigger, or the you're making it into a V. So basically, you're splitting the top. And is that the reason why? And the paclitaxel with decreased inflammation? Yeah, I guess. You know, I think that's what we need to kind of better from a mechanistic perspective. But the interior commissurotomy is real for those. And I've, you know, I work on the phase two trial together with the folks in the Dominican Republic. And you see that it is real. There's just no question about it. Now, some folks may say, yeah, well, does the floor really maintain this way? And the answer is yes, because the phase two trial, which is called Everest, we saw that at three years that the flow rate was maintained and in some patients got, even got better. I just got a report today on uh, now he's 15 months, his flow rate is 33 mils per second, which is like, I said, is he continent? <laughs> I mean, is everything okay? But it's just amazing some of the numbers. So that's what's going to set it apart, at least from a data perspective, from th- some of the other minimally invasive devices. And I remember presenting this to the FDA and having done this a bit and knowing them already, and they kind of know me. Offline, they told me, they said, wow, I mean, this stuff is really the best that they've seen in terms of flow rate. 
Well, thank you for that. So Dr. Elterman, I know our listeners who comprise, again, both patients, but also many urologists listening in as well, would love to get your take on how you perform the procedure, if you could walk us through it. Absolutely. I mean, I think having a conceptualization of what we're actually doing with the Optilum BPH is really important. So very similar principles to the Optilum stricture device, which some people may be familiar with in terms of the idea of balloon dilatation of a stricture, and then the drug gets eluded into these sort of micro fragmentations of the scar tissue, a little bit different. So essentially, it is a very quick procedure. It's generally done under conscious sedation or general anesthetic. I've done it under conscious sedation. It may be able to be moved to sort of a local type anesthetic or a block in the future. And it's really comprised of two steps. The first step is a pre-dilatation, and then it's followed by the dilatation with the actual drug-coated balloon. So what you do essentially is you just go in with a a rigid 21 French cystoscope. You take out the optics and you leave the outer sheath. Through that, you're going to pass a pre-dilatation balloon. And you need to understand that this is essentially a double balloon. There is, it looks like a figure eight, like a bubble, all right? But it's two. And the idea is that you will pass this into the bladder, put your 30-degree lens back in alongside of it, and then you'll position it such that the first balloon is sitting within the bladder. The second back half of the balloon, two balls, is sitting within the prostate. And where they meet down is exactly where it's going to sort of fit in or hook into the bladder neck. And so as opposed to the old dowd balloons, which had the tendency to maybe slip forward into the bladder or slip back, this is going to lock in position. And you're actually going to inflate it and you'll feel that you won't be able to push it forward or back. It's going to be locked in at the bladder neck. And by inflating it up to a a very large volume, it's like 90 French, you're actually going to cause the prostate to split, as we said, at the 12 o'clock position, creating this anterior commissurotomy. And so you're going to have this raw surface of tissue that was previously covered, and you take out the balloon. It's a two-minute pre-dilatation, and then you remove that balloon. You go back in with your scope, and you'll look anteriorly to confirm that, of course, that commissurotomy was made. And then you'll take the second balloon, which is, again, the drug-coated balloon, And they come in different lengths. And so you are going to have to know the distance from the bladder neck to the external sphincter. And you'll be able to select small, medium, large, extra large. They come in different sizes. And so once again, you pass your drug-coated balloon now through the outer sheath of your scope. You come alongside it. You position it. And the way you position it is at the tail of the balloon, you'll see it taper down. And there is a blue mark. And you're essentially going to position yourself just distal or beyond the external sphincter. And you're going to see that little blue mark in the tail coming through the sphincter. And you're going to slowly inflate it. And again, you'll feel that double balloon locking into position so that it doesn't move forward or back. And then you'll inflate it to the proper atmospheres of pressure. And that is when the drug coating is going to be pushed right up into that anterior commissurotomy that you made. And it will be absorbed or eluded through because it's quite hydrophilic. And so then you leave it in place for the requisite amount of time. And then you can remove the balloon. You don't even have to check again. And the case is completed and you put in a catheter. So those are essentially the two key steps. It's the pre-dilatation and then the drug-coated component to it. And these entire procedures, I have to say, we're doing now a post-market study in Canada called the Summit Study. And we have these procedures. You know, if you add the pre-dilatation time, the dilatation time, call it 10 to 12 minutes, you know, changing things. These cases are done in 15 to 20 minutes, perhaps. So they don't take a lot of time. And so that's, those are all the steps. Well, and then when counseling patients, what do you kind of tell them in terms of what can they expect in terms of recovery and after the procedure? So they're all performed as outpatient procedures. I mean, this is a minimally invasive therapy, right? We don't admit patients to hospital. They're able to go home the same day. We're doing these in an outpatient's office setting or a small surgery center like an ASC. We do put in a catheter. I like to leave it in for 24 to 48 hours, and then we have them come back to the clinic for whatever, sending a nurse to take it out. We expect them to have typical, some mild hematuria, a little bit of dysuria for a couple of days, nothing different than any other BPH procedure. And that's about it. I mean, again, because we're not putting in any implants, leaving any foreign material aside from the medication, which they don't feel, you know, heating, cutting, whatever. I think the recovery may be a little bit easier as well as the patients go through the coming weeks. I'm very excited about getting my hands on this new technology, especially to be able to have it as another option that can be performed in the, you know, potentially even in the office setting under a local, as you mentioned, and already utilizing Optilum technology in my practice for men with urethral strictures. So that was thrilled to see the Optilum BPH version uh, receive the FDA approval in July. So 
I think it's really going to be a no-brainer for a lot of men in my practice with some of the reported outcomes, including more than doubling of the peak flow time or peak flow rate, as Dr. Kaplan mentioned, durability through four years, as well as having no change in erectile and ejaculatory function uh, scores. Congrats again to the two of you for helping bring this technology to market, as well as everyone else involved, including the entire Optilum team at Eurotronic. Before we wrap up, I wanted to give both of you an opportunity to share any final thoughts for listeners, starting with Dr. Kaplan. Well, it's interesting as this has evolved and having been around when we had the first explosion of minimally invasive devices and how they kind of, many of them waned, some of them, frankly, because of reimbursement issues as much as anything else. And now kind of a renaissance between the Eurolift and Resume and the ITIND and there's a whole bunch of stents and where we're going to position all of these things and the different delivery systems. But certainly in terms of efficacy, and there's no head-to-head trials, but just looking at the numbers, I think from the perspective of what we believe will give the best, certainly objective improvement so far, I think that the Optimum device will be there. What will determine long-term success with it is obviously reimbursement as well. So if you get good reimbursement, and we anticipate that you will, with these long-term results, it could become the leading minimally invasive device for patients looking at trying to get the best long-term uh, results. It's going to be fun to figure out where everything fits, but I'd rather have more choices and see where they fit than no choices where nothing fits. Dr. Altman, any final thoughts today? I think that the Optilum BPH procedure is a big step forward in the minimally invasive space. It's really the first to bring together a medical therapy with the paclitaxel with a drug delivery system that actually changes the prostate anatomy through a technology. I think that's really unique. Again, as Steve said, we're going to have to try and find out who are the best patients to put these in, the best prostates, et cetera. But because it does come in these different sizes, I think it's going to be a quite a, a versatile tool for us to use. So I'm excited to be able to offer it to my patients now, both in the commercial setting and in the trial setting that we have going on. And I think it's just a really exciting time to be in the field of BPH and minimally invasive technologies. And the last thing I'll say, of course, is I'm wearing my Society of Benign Prostatic Disease t-shirt today. And for all the listeners, whether you're interested in BPH a little bit, you don't have to be a physician, but we invite everybody to check out our society to join. There's a website for the SOBPD, or Society of Benign Prostatic Disease. We have a standalone meeting this coming fall in Dallas. And of course, we have a half-day meeting every year at the AUA. So everybody's welcome to join and be involved in the latest when it comes to benign prostatic disease and BPH. Well, thank you again. We'll make sure to include a link in the show notes as well to, for the society. And we really appreciate you both taking time out of your busy schedule today to chat with us on the Prostate Health Podcast. You both have, as always, delivered significant value today for our listeners. Thank you again. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you again for listening to the Prostate Health Podcast. For those of you wanting to dive in even deeper, make sure to check out the Prostate Health Academy, which offers comprehensive and easy to navigate lessons that I have prepared for you. There's also an active private community forum, and I am there every day providing support, insight, and answering questions. To learn more, just go to www.prostatehealthacademy.com and click on join now. Well, that's it for today. We will see you at the next episode. Thank you.